But we begin with W.T. Cosgrave, leader of Common and Yale and leader of the Irish government from 1922 to 1932 in the then Irish Free State. Leader until he was defeated by Eamon de Valera's Fianna Fáil party in the 1932 general election. I have just tendered to His Excellency the Governor-General advice to dissolve the Oireachtas and to summon the new Oireachtas for the 2nd of March. I suppose the most striking qualities that I recall in Mr. Cosgrave... James Dillon. ...were wisdom and integrity. A more aggressive man at the head of the government during the Civil War... Ernest Blythe. ...might have split it, whereas Cosgrave actually welded it together. He found compromises when compromises had to be found, and he was a forward-looking man. Oh, courage, rectitude, simplicity, good humour, honesty, fearlessness. And he showed that on very many occasions. Richard Mulcahy. I never found anything in him that didn't show that he was fearless in standing for the things that require to be stood for in Ireland so that Irish work might go on. And I think fair play was the keynote of his whole character and his whole career. Michael Hayes. He was a passionate believer in justice for all our citizens. Ernest Blythe recalling his first meeting with W.T. Cosgrave. I came to work with him in early in 1919, after Sinn Féin had won the general election that year and Dáil Éireann had been established. Uh, I, I, the Dáil met in January, I think. I didn't come along till March because I was in Belfast jail. The government was already formed, but after a few days, Mr. De Valera added me as an extra minister and I began to attend meetings and meet Mr. Cosgrave whom I knew, of course, before that as a man who'd fought in 1916 and as one of the early Sinn Féin members of the corporation and a man who was a bit more, a little bit older than the, most of us and a good deal more experienced because we were beginners in public affairs. After the sudden deaths of both Michael Collins and Arthur Griffith, W.T. Cosgrave seemed the obvious choice to take over. Well, I, I, I asked him once, how did he come to be selected? His son, Liam Cosgrave. And he said that uh, he looked around him at the time and it happened that he was older than most of his uh, colleagues, that he had a longer public experience because he'd been a member of the Dublin Corporation from uh, 1909 and was chairman of the Finance Committee, which gave him considerable administrative experience. That in the circumstances, while he did not aspire either then or at any other time to uh, any particular office, he felt that it was a duty that devolved upon him, and in that spirit he accepted it. He didn't want it at all. John A. Costello. He was quite prepared to do the job when he had to do it. He'd never made the slightest grumble or gross or growl about having to do the job, however difficult it was. He did it, but for one thing he would be, would be extremely glad if anybody would come along ambition it, if they wanted, they could have it for the asking. And he had certainly no, no desire at all for political preferment for himself, and no ambition for himself in the way of personal advancement. That was, I think, one of his clearly, clearly outstanding qualities. The rights and liberties secured by the treaty must be preserved. The fullest possible advantage must be taken of our membership of the British Commonwealth of Nations and of our proximity to the British market. I remember a phrase that was used about a great American... Paddy McGilligan. ...that his character presided upon events. Uh, I think the meaning there to be that he swayed and moulded the events by the force of his personality. I found that he was a very useful member of the government. Ernest Blythe with plenty of knowledge and plenty of common sense and, of course, a very humane outlook on every aspect of public affairs. I think that was one of the first things that, that uh, impressed me about him was that he had the, the truly Christian outlook on all these things. I used the expression simple frequently about him. 
sometime Attorney General in Cosgrave's government, John A. Costello. He was anything but simple in the ordinary sense because he had a depth uh, which uh, would surprise people in many ways. But I found that he had uh, two of the things perhaps that struck me part on together from his achievements in public life were his geniality and his sense of humour and his capacity for making conversation. In the 1920s, he faced everything that came. General Mulcahy again. In the same fearless way uh, as he faced his entry into the Rising. To a greater extent, perhaps, they were more unexpected, as far as he was concerned, than was the Rising. The Rising was unexpected to all of us, and no doubt to Mr. Cosgrove, but he to think that he ever thought that he would have to face the difficulties of August 1922 after the death of Griffith and of Collins could never have entered his mind and that the difficulties he faced at that particular time were really greater than he might feel could be faced even with Griffith and Collins there. The government party is the one party in this country which can secure for the people political and economic salvation. I was a very intimate friend of his for the whole period. Michael Hayes. From 1922 onwards. He had left school from the Christian Brothers in Francis Street at the age of little over 14, but had read steadily and constantly after that. And up to the day of his death, was still reading and still interested in history. In particular about Dublin. He knew almost everything that was to be known about the history of Dublin, about its city council and its powers, about its streets and its buildings and its people. He had studied the 18th century particularly well. I wish I had words of sufficient command to express all I know about Mr. Cosgrove as a man, as an Irishman, as a patriot and a soldier. Another colleague, General Sean McKeown, speaking the night Cosgrave died. Mr. Cosgrove was gifted by God with very great qualities. He had the qualities of patience, charity, kindness, meekness, unselfishness, and, above all, a sense of fair play to every section of the people without distinction of creed or class or politics. It must be remembered that uh, his cabinet was were, was composed of a large number of men, of 12 men, of very high quality. And it, I'm sure that leadership in that was not an easy matter, but yet he succeeded in doing that extremely well. And um, if I might point out that in his whole handling of every situation, he was always on the side of time, have patience, wait, just don't rush anything, but at the same time when the decision had to be taken and taken, he could carry it out with firmness, with tolerance, and with, I think, all the virtues that an Irishman should have. I had from the beginning a very high opinion of Mr. Cosgrave. Ernest Blythe again. He was a man of practical, uh, of a very practical outlook who took a common sense view of everything and who was never afraid to voice an unpopular opinion and yet was never cranky or never inclined to be uh, merely controversial but uh, uh, stated his views uh, uh, reasonably and stood his ground when it was necessary to stand it. There's just one incident that occurs to my mind at the time when I myself was very enthusiastic about the hydroelectric development in this country through the harnessing of the Shannon. And I occasionally spoke to my colleagues and, about how the development was going. One occasion, late in the operation of that scheme, I apparently spoke more greater at greater length possibly with more enthusiasm than he thought was warranted. Not that he disagreed with my aims or my objectives, but I remember saying to me, you're arguing at great lengths about this. Uh, if you go much further, you'll make some of us wonder what's all the argument about. 
and you may make some of us begin to wonder is what you're arguing about as sound as it appears to be, as, as you think it is. In other words, he was accepting my point of view, but he was merely pointing out to me, we're all here associated with you in this big venture. And uh, he was almost saying, <laughs> the longer you talk about it, <laughs> the less it will be. Now, he gave me the line there that he accepted fully all that development, and the only thing was that he thought I was overdoing in my enthusiasm, the argumentation for it. <clears throat> the last few days of the general election were, of course, very much more interesting than the earlier days. The meetings were sometimes late, there were bonfires, there was great enthusiasm, but in any case, the contest has taught us to consider all the points that were at issue in the, in the election, and I think that people generally will be satisfied with the result. We knew that the country could never come to normality. Ernest Blythe on Common Gale's perception of Fianna Fáil. As long as the representatives of a large of the population stayed outside the parliament. And we, uh, I certainly, I, I'm sure of the, this about Mr. Cosgrave, that he regarded the ultimate defeat of our party as part of the business of normalizing the country. <laughs> The program of Fianna Foyle has now been definitely adopted as the national policy of the Irish people. Michael Hayes looking back at that change of power in 1932 through the ballot box, nine years after the Civil War, the defeated in that Civil War taking power democratically. To him, I think, is due a great deal of the credit of the position which the Doyle now occupies. He believed from the very beginning the provision should be made for the opponents of the treaty and of his government who did not recognize the state. He felt that no normal parliamentary life could take place in the country until these people all recognized the authority of the Doyle. He was aware, of course, that their entry into the Doyle might be harmful to the interests of his party, but he was much more interested in the country than he was in his party. And his conduct of the Doyle as president through the, through the whole of his 10 years made, it seems to me, a vital contribution to the establishment of normal parliamentary life in this country. Well, I entered the Doyle in the year that Mr. Cosgrave left office. That was in 1932. James Dillon, a future leader of Fine Gael. Subsequently... I became deputy leader of the Fine Gael party under Mr. Cosgrave uh, about 1936. And I suppose the most striking qualities that I recall in Mr. Cosgrave were wisdom and integrity. He belonged to that rare company of men whose word was better than his bond. If he gave you his word in respect of any matter, he would always feel constrained to perform what you understood him to undertake. And that's a quality that you don't find very frequently anywhere and most infrequently of all in public life. We hear in these times a lot about the lay apostolate, meaning the incorporation of Christian principles into your daily life. I would say of Mr. Cosgrave that he was the very pattern of this ideal. He, had, he, he used to take uh, very strong views about certain things, and especially about individuals. But he never fell into the error of confusing people with what people did. Though he hated some of the things people did, he never hated the people who did them. Um, he distrusted some people profoundly and uh, couldn't bring himself to associate with them or to work with them. But I've never heard him say a word which indicated anything approximating to personal hatred. Once he'd made up his mind about someone, it was very hard to get him to change. 
But in regard to matters of policy, he was always eager and willing to hear argument, and indeed always ready to change his mind if he felt that his colleagues' arguments were sufficiently powerful to require him to do so. And so I'd sum him up in my memory by saying that he was in fact as nearly perfect a Christian gentleman as I have ever known. And I don't think anything I could add to that would tell you more explicitly what my recollection of William T. Cosgrave is today. I think in any assessment you look at the monuments that were left behind. Professor Morris Manning from the archives. And he found himself in the position of being head of government at an extraordinarily difficult time, a time a more difficult time than any other leader ever had to lead. Uh, it was under his leadership that the institutions which have survived to this day were founded and they have found that they've proved durable. Uh, the whole tradition of honest administration and incorruptible civil service, uh, the, the army loyal to the civil arm, all of these things happened. Now clearly it wasn't a one-man show and it might have happened under some other leader, but he was the person who led it during that time and at that him must go the credit. Morris Manning concluding that archive-based portrait of W.T. Cosgrave. Evaluated by his contemporaries and all of those recordings with his former cabinet colleagues were recorded by myself within a day or two of W.T. Cosgrave's death in 1965. And Michael Laffin's book, Judging W.T. Cosgrave, is published by the Royal Irish Academy. <laughs>